You probably already know that mitochondria, the power stations of the cell, started their life as free-living prokaryotes before one day, maybe two billion years ago, one of them swiped right with an archaea, they merged and paved the way for complex, multicellular, eukaryotic life. So mitochondria are actually a separate life form that we've been keeping alive inside us. Okay, so far nothing new. You've probably also already heard that, for the majority of us, part of our DNA comes from extinct hominid species. For example, if you're European, about 2-3% to of your DNA will be Neanderthal. However, did you know that your DNA is also riddled with evidence of previous invasion, scattered with dead carcasses, and littered with destruction? And that you are almost one-tenth virus. In medical school I was never that interested in viruses. Virology seemed a bit of an esoteric field, we didn't have that many antivirals, so I thought I'd concentrate on diseases that we can actually cure. But the more I learn about viruses now, the more fascinating I find them. We, and by we I mean living things, have been invaded by viruses for millions of years. Rather like an East London kebab, no one's quite sure if viruses are alive. Each contains a short sequence of RNA or DNA. They replicate by inserting themselves into their host's DNA and allow the host's genetic photocopying machine to do the hard work for them. When we started analysing the human genome, we found dozens of dead viruses lurking in our genome. But how did this happen? Surely our distant relative that got infected with the virus would have just died. Well, yes, a lot did, many millions, but occasionally a virus would have infiltrated its way into our DNA without causing catastrophic problems. If it had made its way into a sex cell, like a sperm or an egg, it would then be passed on to the next generation. Thus, viruses manage to inculcate themselves into our genome. Over the years, mutations have occurred, but they're still easily recognisable as viral in origin. Recent estimates place as much as 8% of our DNA as having come from a virus. We call these sequences endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs, and they're found in pretty much every jawed vertebrate. Just imagine if some diabolical genius managed to find a way to reactivate all these dormant viruses and kill us from within. Wait, what? Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. For years, we thought this viral DNA was inactive, like huge swathes of your genome referred to as junk DNA, proving that even though I know you skip leg day, you will always have some junk in your trunk. But in recent years, we're learning that these viral fossils do actually have some use. For example, stem cells have an ability to be pluripotent. This means that they can become any type of cell. When researchers disabled the viral origin HERV-H, it meant that stem cells lost the ability to be pluripotent and they could only become one type of cell. Another ERV sequence was found to be crucial to our innate immune system, with the authors of the study explaining that the viral DNA has come to act as a reservoir of genetic innovation for the immune system. So we have actually repurposed DNA that came from a virus to help us defend ourselves against infection. Fate, it seems, is not without a sense of irony. But it's not all doom and gloom. There is some good news. Mm-hmm. No, it's more bad news. We are soon to enter an era of xenotransplantation. That means transplanting organs between species. Pigs are a promising donor species, but of course pigs have their own ERVs. And it's very possible that human recipients will get infected in ways we simply can't predict. And I promise I didn't just mention this because a porcine endogenous retrovirus is referred to as a perv. Readers of the selfish gene will recognise the ALU transposable element. Transposable elements are short sequences of DNA whose sole purpose is to reproduce. They are sometimes referred to as selfish DNA parasites, behaving somewhat similarly to viruses. It's unclear how they evolved, perhaps they too were viruses to begin with. What we do know is that they hop about your genome willy-nilly, causing all manner of destruction. ALU has managed to produce one million copies of itself throughout our genome. Its blundering tendency to pop up anywhere has implicated it in breast cancer, stomach cancer, bowel cancer, lung cancer, Allport syndrome, familial hypercholesterolemia, haemophilia, chorioretinal degeneration, Ewing sarcoma, Lee syndrome, mucopolysaccharidosis, neurofibromatosis, porphyria, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Transposable elements now account for a bewildering 45% of our overall DNA. They wreak havoc and have killed millions of humans and other organisms over the years. 
yet every cell in our body diligently expends time and energy duplicating them. But look on the bright side, literally. It seems our ability to see three colours originated with Alu. Maybe 30 million years ago, a common ancestor to us, apes, and the old world monkeys found themselves with a duplicate of the opsin gene, which helps us see. A rampaging Alu was busy duplicating itself and accidentally took opsin along for the ride, causing us to have three copies instead of the previous two, allowing old world monkeys and apes like us to see more colours than, say, Fido here. So, dozens of horrible ways to die versus the ability to see this number. Yeah, I'm not so sure we did that well out of this deal. Okay, three color vision was a little bit more important than that. For example, the proto monkey with the newly upgraded vision would have been much better at identifying edible fruits, which may have meant the difference between life and death if, say, you stopped being able to make your own vitamins. The final ghosts that I want to talk about are not foreign invaders that have become part of us, but the broken down wrecks of genes that once did something. I mentioned one of these in a previous video, L-galonolactone oxidase, or GULO, which allows animals to produce their own vitamin C. Our version of this gene mutated maybe as much as 60 million years ago, meaning that we and our primate cousins need to get vitamin C from our diet instead of being able to make it for ourselves. For a completely unnecessary analogy, this is clearly still recognisable as a Lamborghini, even though it's been rendered useless. And likewise, our version of the Gulo gene is still recognisable because it's 85% the same as the functional copy in a dog, for example, even though our version has been wrapped around a lamppost and has no wheels. These are called pseudogenes. Like nonagenarian war veterans, they can no longer perform the tasks that they once did, but they act as living history lessons, nostalgic reminders of days gone by. We think we've got about 20,000 pseudogenes, which is almost the same number as functional genes. So you can see that your genome is a wasteland of crashed Lamborghinis, selfish parasites, and dead viruses. Listen, I'm an easygoing guy, right? But I take a stand when necessary. And who the hell calls this a powerhouse, all right? It's a power station. Powerhouse went out of date about 100 years ago. You've got to stop using that term, okay? It's easy. Power station, gas station, police station, fire station, space station, bus station, train station, plane station. Oh.